Hi, my name is Cindy Rang, and I own the Fabric Patch Quilt Shop in Ephrata, Washington. We've been here for over 20 years, and we've been doing classes for at least that long. We recently started doing videos on YouTube, and part of that was we started this row sampler. So if you've been following along with this, you've already done 12 classes, you've probably got your quilt top done, and maybe you've made at least 12 other suggested quilts along the way. So the problem now is you've got all of these unfinished tops that need to be turned into something that's quilted. So I went ahead and put together all of the different ways that you can quilt your quilt top. And I have to apologize up front because I think that it's going to end up being about an hour and a half long. But I come from a medical background and I believe in informed consent and what that means is that you can make all get all of the information that you need prior to making a decision. And I think that comes into play with quilting because if I do a class on hand quilting and you think that's your only option or I do a class on big stitch quilting or or long arm quilting. There's all kinds of options for you to be able to finish your quilt. So, I'm just going to go through all of them. I try to go through it fairly quickly, but at least that way you'll know how you might want to finish your quilt top. So again, there might be a better way to do it and do each of them individually, but at the risk that you will miss an option, I've lumped it all together. So grab yourself a bottle of wine, not just a glass, sit back and let's get started. All right, so we've come out to my quilt studio and we're gonna talk about all of the different ways that we can finish your quilt top. What happens when you finished your quilt is, of course, this is what it looks like. It's just a quilt top. It's not really quilted yet. And there's a reason why you have to finish the whole thing up. When I am finished with a quilt top, I tend to store it with my binding. I go ahead and make my binding right away because what will happen is if you set this down, go on to your next project, start sewing something else, and then you realize you don't have your binding made, if you need to buy fabric, it could be that all of that fabric is already all gone. So I make sure that I'm prepared if I end up sitting it somewhere. I also kind of like to get my backing figured out just so that when I'm ready to start a project, it might be a Sunday afternoon, it might be a late Wednesday night, I have everything and I'm ready to go. The other thing that you of course need is you're going to need your battings. Batting isn't always an easy choice. Uh, I tend to use a lot of wool. Um, there's wool, there's bamboo, there's soy, there is some great stuff that's made out of recycled plastic bottles. That's super nice. Um, the two most common are cotton and polyester. The main difference between these two is that cotton will maintain its density. So as you're quilting through it, um, you still just really don't see the quilting very much. It doesn't change the texture, but in polyester, when you put that quilting stitch in there, it goes down to basically zero. It loses its fluff, essentially. So if you are undecided about what you're doing, but you feel like you really don't want your quilting to be front and center, then I would choose a cotton. Uh, cotton also is very breathable, so it'll be warm in the winter, it'll be cool in the summer. It's kind of an all-purpose, all-season batting. Polyester is a little bit loftier, a little bit lighter weight. Um, I usually use polyester in kids' quilts. People will ask if we should use polyester to make sure that it lasts long. Um, the most important thing is to make sure that you use your 100% quilters cotton quality cotton fabric to make sure that your quilt lasts. So these are the kind of the two main choices. Your other option is to not put batting in it at all. And sometimes I don't. If I have something like this, this is just a flannel on one side and it's a minky on the other. It is a really nice baby weight. And what's happened is since I don't have that third layer in there, I don't have to worry about keeping everything together because that's why we quilt it. We quilt everything to make sure that everything stays exactly where we put it. If you've ever picked up a quilt and you find this funny little wad of batting down in the lower corner, it's because it wasn't quilted enough or wasn't quilted at all. Um, 
So something like this where we just have the two layers, all you have to do is just put right sides together, stitch around almost like an envelope, turn it right side out through a little hole, and then you can just put a little bit of top stitching on there just to give it a nice little finished edge, and you're done because you don't have to hold anything together. Because of course your quilt top is finished. It's not gonna fall apart. Nothing weird is gonna happen. The reason we're quilting those layers together is because we're quilting the layers together. The quilt top, the batting, and the backing. So that's why we need that quilting in there. And that's why something like this, this is just a simple little microwave bowl. Even this, just because of the size of it, there's a funny little line that we sew first before we put the whole thing together and that's just to quilt those layers together to keep everything right where it's supposed to be so nothing will shift. All right, so um, while we're going through the different types of quilting, I've put together these little, we're just gonna call them mini quilts just so that I can get them done and get this video finished for you guys rather than doing full quilts. But I want to go through the whole process and show you the steps for hand quilting, for machine quilting on your domestic machine, for long arming, tying, all of those little things. So I've put together some quick little blocks. These are actually going to be just little mug rugs, which is a nice option when you're making a little mini quilt. Um, this came from a panel, I think it's called Indigo Cottage. So it has hearts on it and six little different houses, which is kind of cool. And of course, all of these borders are from the Fantasy line. And all of those fabrics are still available on our website. One thing I want to mention is that when you have a striped border, we didn't talk, I don't know that we talked about this in the borders class, but a stripe really should be mitered. If you have a stripe that comes over and then another stripe that's somehow growing out of behind that stripe, it just doesn't look right. So if you've chosen a stripe for a border, you should miter this. So we just did a quick little video on exactly how to do a miter, and that's going to be attached in the link um, so that you can see that. Um, or, or there's going to be a link in the description, as I think I'm supposed to say that, and then you'll be able to see how to do that if you're not sure how to do that. Um, so anyway, we'll be working on these as we go along. So I just want to do some close-up pictures of some of the quilts. So this happens to be quilting on a long arm. We're going to spend some time in my long arm room. But what you can see is if you want something that is very definitive, where you are really, you know, focusing on the fabric and um, the quilting and uh, maybe you have some fusible applique that you want to stitch down. Uh, long arm is kind of nice because it's basically like doodling on your quilt. So this is my preferred method of quilting my quilt, but obviously you have to have access to a long arm. But it gives you a nice um, finish that's kind of a nice dense quilty finish. So I tend to like that. This is quilting on your home machine. So again, you can, you're a little bit more limited because it's like moving the paper under the needle. I'm gonna show you some tricks for that. This happens to be a disappearing nine patch or a split nine patch block. And so this is just a simple quilt, um, easy to do on your home machine and I'll show you the tricks for that. Your other option with quilting on your machine is to do what we call stitching in the ditch. So if you look at this, from the top of this quilt, you almost don't see any quilting at all. What's happened is we just went ahead and put on our walking foot and our stitch guide and we just sewed within these lines. I'm gonna flip this over to the back and you'll really be able to see it. So you can see all of these lines where we just followed the line. So this is super simple because you don't have to make any decisions. You're just gonna follow the line, sew down the line. It's an easy, easy, thing to do and it doesn't take a whole lot of um, excessive skill level. This is very similar to that, except if you're just coming off of the line a little bit, you'd be able to see a little bit of a stitch line, which makes it kind of fun, but also done on your domestic machine. And then of course, some of the things that tend to be a little more old fashioned is the tying. A lot of people still tie their quilts. Um, for me personally, um, anything that's still tied in my collection is either something that um, I purchased somewhere or something that I still have inherited that I haven't um, 
changed out yet. What I find is that a lot of the stuff that they used for tying, it leaves kind of a permanent little hole there. So once you've decided to quilt it instead, uh, you kind of have to deal with that hole. There's nothing wrong with tying. Everything is held together really well. Um, we used to tie in the corners, which would kind of hide if something weird had happened in there. Um, yarn is probably my least uh, favorite thing to use. You can use DMC floss and I'll show you all of the tricks for that if that's what you decide to do. This quilt though has held up really well. Um, if you were to feel this though, what you would know is that the batting that's in here is just um, probably just a flannel sheet. So there's the quilt, there's a very thin layer in there, and then this is probably also just a percale, and this came around to be the binding. So um, this was one that I um, found at a yard sale and um, was able to acquire. So a fun one. And then this is, if you like the idea of hand quilting but you don't want the fussiness of it, this is what's called a big stitch. So I'm anxious to show you this. This is kind of a really fun thing to do. So it has the look of hand quilting, but it's really a little bit more definitive and a great big bold stitch. So it gives kind of a fun, almost a modern look to something which is kind of cool. And then this one, this is of course hand quilting. So if you look up close here, you can see that with hand quilting, you can go ahead and follow. There's actually hearts and swirls in this border. So um, it's not as obvious. Um, a lot of it is because the border is so busy. Um, this over here, this is just that standard grid. You see this a lot with hand quilting. This is a typical thing to do. This is what we're gonna be doing um, in our video. Um, and then also for border work, typically we'll come off just about a half inch or an inch so that you can see the work. But for this particular one, the stitching was done in the ditch and you can see that. And then up here, this is a hand stitched stipple, which is kind of a fun, a whole lot of stitches and a bit of a labor of love for that. So hand quilting is something that I think is easily recognizable, absolutely noticeable. And when I see that at a quilt show or I see it in somebody's home, I immediately am impressed just because a lot of time went into that. Um, hand quilting is something that you don't have to have a sewing machine. You just have to get it all basted and ready to go, but it is going to take you some time. That being said, it's worth what it looks like when it's done, and it doesn't require a whole lot of skill. It is a simple little stitch that with just a little bit of practice, your stitches will be super even. And I have to say that hand quilting is kind of addictive. I like doing it. Um, I just think that if it's the first time that you've quilted, you probably don't want to make anything really big. If you're gonna hand quilt a queen size quilt, by the time you get it done, you will hate it. You will never want to hand quilt anything again. But if you start with something kind of small, a little mug rug, a little wall hanging, a little baby quilt, it's kind of a nice, relaxing, simple stitch to do. Um, you're just re-threading needles all the time. So keep that in mind and um, I think that's actually where we're going to start. The way. I mentioned earlier that hand quilting seems to have a bit of a bad rap because it takes so long. It does take longer, obviously, because you are stitching every stitch by hand. So it's very laborious, but it's absolutely worth it. I find it to be relaxing. Again, you're gonna have to decide for yourself. So I'm just gonna show you the notions that I suggest and the way that I do it. With all of these techniques, I just want to mention that this is quilting according to me, which means nothing. This is just what I find to be helpful, what I find um, so that I have good, consistent results, and it's what I teach in my shop. You might find that something doesn't work well for you or somebody else teaches it a little bit different. There's not a lot of rules. You just have to find what's gonna work well so that you can get your quilt top finished be happy with the results and it will last for as long as you'd like it to. So let's go ahead and look at the notions. So the two most important things that you are going to need are your quilting thread and your needles. So let's take a look at the thread. You can see that just even sitting here, the thread sort of spools off a little bit. 
Hand quilting thread is very, very different from machine thread. It's very thick, it's coarse, it has kind of a, almost a layer of, of wax on it. The reason for that is because when you're hand stitching and you're constantly pulling it um, in and out, in and out, in and out, you wear the thread. And so if you are just using a basic cotton machine thread, it's going to snap, it's going to fray, it's not going to last at all. So do make sure that you have a hand quilting thread. These are pretty much the only colors that I ever keep on hand, um, is just a white, off-white, a tan, and a black. I think I also have a gray somewhere, but these are the colors that I use most often, just because they're kind of those traditional colors. Um, if you accidentally put this on your sewing machine, your sewing machine will have a fit. It will not like it at all. And again, just that funny little spooling, it just doesn't like to be told to do micro little things. So um, you, it'll spool off of your bobbin. So when you take off what you want, and typically what you're looking at when you're hand quilting is about 18 inches, um, you typically have this funny little groove on the bottom. And what that's for is if you pull your thread in there and tighten it, it's going to hold it so it's not unspooling like that one. So we're gonna go ahead and cut off the thread that we're gonna use. And then let's take a look at the needles. The quilting needles that we use, they're actually called betweens, but they're a very small needle. They're short, and the reason that they're short is because I'm gonna show you this little rocking stitch that you do where you put multiple stitches on the needle before you pull it out. Now, if when you have something small like that, you can still get about four or five stitches, which is great, and you're still able to get that needle out. If you have a needle that's extremely long, by the time you, first of all, it's not going to rock as easily. The other thing that's gonna happen is if you get too many stitches on that needle, you will not be able to pull it out. So even though this seems like it's a little difficult to hold, Again, once you have a little bit of practice, you'll be okay with a between. And again, that's typically what they're called, our betweens. Another interesting thing about needles is that this is a size 10. This one is a size eight. It's odd that the smaller the number, the bigger the needle. This one is a size 13, and I don't know if you can see it or not, but it is even shorter than, than the little 10. These are, I tend to use a 10. These are the needles that I like. They're the Tulip brand, the Hiroshima needles. These are, they're a little spendy. You're going to pay about a dollar a needle for them, but they're totally worth it. What's happened is they're polished, and um, so they glide through your fabric really, really easily. And the other thing is that they last a lot longer. They stay sharp longer and they last longer. It's not uncommon to break a hand needle and I don't think that, I'm not, I'm not sure that I've ever broken a Hiroshima needle. So I like these, these are my favorite, but there's all kinds of them and you can get away with a 10 cent needle um, without any issues. All right, so threading the needle, we're gonna go to that next because I just want to show you that a couple things with threading the needle. When I thread it, what I tend to do is I just hold it in between my finger and then what I do is I put the needle, see if I can tell where my eye is, I put the needle on top of the thread. Here we go. And then you just pull it through. So, um, that seems to work pretty well for me. I'm gonna show you a little trick though in a minute if that doesn't work. So once you've pulled it through, you are only going to use one strand of thread and I'm gonna show you a quilter's knot. So what a quilter's knot is, and I'm gonna turn my hands around so you can see from my side. What you're gonna do is if you look at the end of the needle and the end of the thread, you're going to make it a circle. You're not gonna make an X like this. See how that's an X? You're gonna make a circle, so you're coming into the circle. When you come into the circle, I'm standing a little funny. I'm gonna hold on to that, and now I'm holding on to the thread and the needle at the same time. And I'm gonna wrap this around three times. Holding that tight, now I'm gonna hold on to that wrap and push the needle through that wrap. And in doing that, there is my quilter's knot. So ideally, you want it to be down near the end, and I'm gonna show you why in a minute, but 
no matter what. That's your nice little quilting knot. And then you don't have to do that weird little, oops, I dropped it. Then you don't have to do that weird little tying on top of it, tying on top of it, tying on top of it. All right, and so once you've done that, I do clip off so that you have just a smudge of thread left and I'll show you why when we get started with our stitch because you're actually going to pull that knot into your quilt. That's probably even a little too much. So you leave, can, you know, I don't know if you can see how much is left on there. All right, so put this to the side for a second. Okay, if you have difficulty threading your needles, there's a couple things that you can do. One thing I would mention is that light is as important as magnification. So wherever you're sitting, if you're not by a great light, you just need to have some sort of external thing that can light up your surface. The other thing is that there are some different desk threaders that work really well and all you have to do is, it works pretty slick, you just put your needle in there, eye down, it has a little cutter, you put your thread there, put a little bit of pressure on your thread and there's a tiny little uh, stylus that pushes the thread through into your needle. It works out great. Um, the only thing that you want to know is that you can damage it and that little stylus in there can break. So I've gone through a couple of these. Um, there's another brand. Um, this is the Tulip brand and I do like this one. It just is shaped a little bit different and the only other difference is it has a little magnet on the bottom because I'm often, in fact just a minute ago, I'm always losing needles. And so you can just run this over the top and pick up anything that you've dropped like that. Um, the other thing I just want to mention is the uh, thread magic or thread heaven. Um, this actually works really well. I tend to not use it very much so I might not show you this while we're doing our stitching but if you're doing a relatively large project or you're going through something that's relatively thick in terms of seams or numbers of layers of fabric you might find that you need to put just a little bit of silicone on your thread and that's what this is. So this is kind of nice because now they package it where they've got the main silicone piece and then they have this tiny little one that you can just run it through. And the way that you use it is that you just go ahead and that's why it has these little grooves here. You just run it through and you've put this little layer of silicone if you feel it it just adds like a layer of slippery wax and so it makes it go through a little bit the reason that I probably won't use it for my project is because my project is just a flat piece of fabric with no seams at all but you'll find if you're stitching through multiple layers it might be a little bit difficult for not only for you to get your needle in there but to get your thread all the way through it so that's what you want to and thread magic or thread heaven it's the same idea it's both just silicone they're just packaged a little bit different two different companies the other thing that you oh I was going to talk about your dome this is a um, a thread dome these are fantastic. So if you happen to have somebody over at your house that it is not vision impaired and can go ahead and thread eight needles for you, have them just hold, thread them for you. And then all you do is you just slide it into the spot. And you're just gonna go ahead and bring that through there. And then you just wind it. And as you wind it, it's going to wind all of that thread right into spot number eight. You can put the next one in, wind up spot number seven, spot number whatever, and then when it comes time for you to pull that needle out, it doesn't tangle anything. You can just pull that thread right out, no matter what other thread. And you can see that I've got a little embroidery thread in there even, and nothing gets tangled. Everything is in there in their own little groove, and so somebody can come and load your thread dome for you. So you can go ahead and keep stitching and you don't have to stop because you're having difficulty threading your needles. So um, Brianna will fill this for me a lot. So that's kind of nice. Um, the other thing is thimbles. So thimbles, I'll tell you, I've got a bit of a collection and this is probably, um, this isn't even close um, because thimbles are a very personal thing. You have to decide, uh, first of all, what finger you want to wear it on. And if you like something that is, I mean, these are inexpensive. I think these are less than a dollar. There's also some leather ones. Um, some people like them on their thumb. You can kind of decide what you want. This is more typical. 
um, this one this is more shaped the way that you see now where you've got a metal where you can push easily from either the side or from the top. This particular one is kind of nice because what it does is you put the thimble on for pressing through and then you put this on your thumb so that once you've pressed through, you can go ahead and grab that needle and easily pull that needle all the way through. So if you feel like you've put too much on your needle or if you're doing embroidery with maybe some thicker threads, this works really well. Um, and then, and keeping that in mind, if you are wearing a thimble, um, and if you have some of the thermal thimbles, you can use those the same way. Just put that on, and that's also going to give you that grip to be able to pull that thread, that needle through to get that through. I tend not to be much of a thimble girl when I put my thimble on. I, it's almost like I don't use that finger. So what I like is I like the little leather pieces and so these are kind of nice I'll do a little bit of stitching I find you know that spot that's kind of sore and then I just go ahead and take one of these put it on my finger and then I just have I, I my fingers not getting sweaty it's not feeling encumbered and then all I have to do is just push that needle through you can also get new adhesives because it doesn't really wear out you just it's just the sticky part wears out so I have these stuck on everything all over the place Sometimes I forget that they're there and you find them when you're chopping the chicken. Somebody else finds it. Um, anyway, so thimbles. And then the other thing too is basting. So let's look over here for a second because let's go on to our piece. So this is the piece that I've picked that I thought I would hand quilt and show you the stitch. And again, this is not layered in any way. So I'm only going through one layer. This is my little um, mug rug. I've picked just this um, thin little uh, polyester batting, and then this is my backing. We'll do our binding uh, afterwards. So when you're doing hand quilting, you do have to mark what it is that you're going to stitch. So you might have a stencil, you know, where you're doing um, some sort of a curve or some sort of a flower or something like that. You might do something where you're just going to follow the line or just come just inside of the line. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to do the grid. And if you do the grid, you want to decide, are you gonna do the grid just outside or through the whole thing? If this were an applique flower, of course we would never stitch through it. We would only do our stitching to the end, turn around and come back, and we would do something else in the inside. But for this piece, I think I'm gonna go ahead and stitch all the way through it. I might change my mind as I'm stitching. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my ruler down and I'm going to go ahead and draw my lines. So your, your method for marking is entirely up to you um, to some degree. You want to make sure that the mark that you put on that you're able to get that mark off. So you would never, ever, ever use like a, obviously a ballpoint marker or anything like that. I tend to not use the ones that are water erased because I might not want to wash it right after I'm done with it. So there is, there's lead pencils, there's gray pencils, all of these, these would come off easily in the wash or with um, 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 an eraser. They, they do make an eraser for these pencils. I tend to like the heat away. So we do have the heat away and it comes in a couple different colors. There's white, gray, and yellow. I tend to like that. But just so that you're able to see my mark, I'm gonna go ahead and use a friction marker. I've talked about friction markers before. I do like them because for me personally, I have had success 100% of the time. Um, some people feel a little nervous and you know they say they've put that mark on and that mark keeps coming back, but the way that a a friction marker is made. And again, you have to make sure that you get the Pilot brand. You have to make sure that you get them at the quilt shop. Um, you don't want to use some sort of a counterfeit one, but it actually has two different components. The ink part will go away with heat. And then that funny little gel part, um, you have to wash that out eventually. So once I'm done with this, I'm gonna go ahead and iron it. The first time I wash it, all of that gel will come out. You won't actually see it. But before I wash that gel out, if I put this in the freezer and it gets to 17 degrees, that mark will come back. So 
that's why there's two parts to it. One part, the ink part, is um, iron off, and then that gel part, you will eventually have to wash that off. But the gel part's kind of invisible. I think that's why it kind of freaks people out when they see it. So um, it comes in a, a couple different, quite a few different colors. And just so that you're able to see it really well, I'm gonna go ahead and do it in red. So I am going to mark my grid. Decide how big I want it to be. I'm gonna do a three quarter inch. So I'm lining up on here. Now, it's not magical that this automatically lined up as long as your grid going one way and your grid going the other way is the same measurement, which mine is 3 quarter inch, it will magically do that. And that's what you want, is you want it to look like it was fully planned and everything is going to lock together. If I would have picked one inch or half inch, the same thing would have happened. Okay, so here's our grid. One thing to mention, um, word of advice, uh, don't leave this in the hot car because with your friction marker, if that's what you've decided to use, if you leave this in the hot car, obviously it's going to go away when you come back out. Um, if that happens, again, you can put it in the freezer overnight, your mark will come back, but your stitching on the road will be done. Uh, I went ahead and did my grid over the whole thing so that everything was nice and even all the way around. I, I'll go back and darken that line right there. But again, I would possibly decide just to come in and only, only stitch on the outside. So I'll kind of decide that after I get started. So I'm gonna thread my needle, a couple of needles. I'm gonna kind of get started. I'm gonna get comfortable and then we'll be back. Okay, so I've already started stitching some of these and we're just going to once again thread our needle and I'm going to show you once again our little quilter's knot. I've got my threaded needle and the end of it and again I'm making a circle. So I'm going into the circle. I'm not making an X. Coming into the circle, holding onto that and wrapping three times and then I'm holding that wrap tightly as I push the needle through. And that's what gives me my knot. And then I'm going to clip off the tail, just leaving the slightest little nubbin of a tail because what happens is you pull it through. So I'm gonna start down here come up right here on the corner and what's going to happen as I pull this over is as I come up on this I'm just going to give it a little tug do you hear it it popped through but it's not through on this side so my knot is hidden in between the my backing and my top so it's just popped up in through there every once in a while you'll pull too hard but as long as you've wrapped that three times and you have that nice quilter's knot, it'll pop right up in there and it's hidden your knot. Okay, so if you remember when I drew these lines, this was three quarters of an inch. 
Everybody's going to tell you a different number in terms of how many stitches per inch. It doesn't really matter. I would just say be consistent. If you want to do eight stitches per inch, an expert stitch is like 11 to 12 stitches per inch, but that is like teeny, teeny, tiny, super hard to do. So what I've decided, this is three quarters of an inch, and I am going to do, um, I'm going to do six stitches in here, which is about eight stitches per inch. Let me get that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm running along the side here and I'm just going to count. And I want to come in and out at my corners so that everything kind of lines up properly. So I'll show you what I mean. So I've come up, I've tied my knot. So there's one and oh. When you're using a thimble with hand quilting, you're using your thimble behind because what you're doing is as your needle comes through, you're hitting it with your needle because you want to make sure that you've gone through all three layers, you're hitting that thimble and bringing it around to come back up. So you're not really, you can use something different to push it through, but I don't find that this finger hurts at all. So you're just using it to push everything up through. All right, so we're going to go one. And oh, I have my, I have my hoop too tight. Your hoop, um, you don't want it too tight. You want to be able to um, get a good stitch there. All right, we're gonna start again. Third, third time is the charm. One. And two. And three. And four. And I'm coming up right on the end. So all of my stitches are on there. I'm gonna go again. One. Oh, this hoop is too big for me. I'm gonna have to stop and reposition this. Do you see what's happening? My hand is too small, and so to be over, I can't reach it over there. So I thought this would be good to be able to see in the inside. So I moved it all and I should not have done that. So I'm just going to move this over. And you know, a hoop or not to hoop, it's up to you. It's whatever you like. I kind of go back and forth. I like it because it kind of keeps everything where it's supposed to be, but it's up to you. All right, so see now, now I can, I can reach everything. And this is, what do you think this is, Brianna? A 10 inch hoop, probably? And I tend to use, I normally use a seven inch hoop is sort of the one that I like most often, but it's, uh, I have three seven inch hoops all with something in them. So I probably just need to finish something up. Anyway, one, and my thimble is under there hitting it. Two, two, and, oops, two, oops. <laughs> two, and three, and four. Pull them all out. One, and two, oops, two, and three, and four. So let's look up close for just a second. All you're wanting to make sure is you want to make sure that your stitches are even. So nobody cares about how many. I mean, you could do four stitches, you could do five stitches, you could do eight stitches, as long as these are all even. So everything is even and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something that almost looks so even that it couldn't possibly have been done by hand. So that's what you want, the size doesn't necessarily matter. So you just keep doing that and as you come down, you're gonna turn around, you might go the other way and you just kind of keep working and then you're gonna fill this whole thing in. Once everything is in, then you can go ahead and take off your lines. Um, with hand quilting, I tend to stick with about an 18 to 24 inch length. I think we talked about this in the beginning. Um, the reason you don't want it any longer than that is with a twist, it will absolutely not in it and you don't want that knot. If you find that you're getting a little bit of twist, that's what your thread magic is for.
The other thing that I like is if I have to stop for some reason to do something, um, a lot of people will just park their needle. I don't really like to do that because I don't like to distort anything. So this is just a little magnet. It's just a little earth magnet and it's by Puffin and Company and you can just park your little needle on there. And, um, and sometimes if you have a couple different needles going a couple different ways, uh, you might have two or three of those on there. Ooh, that reminds me, one other quick little tip that I um, should remember to tell you. If you have your stitches and you find that your stitches, let me show you something. One, oops, I'm gonna have to rehoop again. Two and three. And, yep, I definitely need to hoop again and four okay so my stitches are going this way i need to pull my needle this way if i pull this out and if i pull my needle my thread this way watch that stitch right there what will happen is if i pull this all of a sudden that little stitch is going to sit like that so if you have stitches that are not resting straight it's because when you pull your thread, you need to pull in the way that your stitches will lay. So this thread's gonna go this way, and then usually when I get to the end, if for some reason I'm gonna go that way, I'm gonna put a little knot right there before I turn around and I'm only gonna pull the thread that way. It does make a difference as to whether or not um, things are going to lay straight. All right, I'm gonna work on this a little bit and then I'll come back and show you when I'm done. Okay, so we are in my long arm room with my dog, Lizzie, and um, I bought my first long arm back in 1999. I've had this one since 2007, and most people that buy long arms buy them because they have a plethora of quilt tops. Uh, I was no different, so um, I tend to store my quilt tops along with a backing, um, along with binding, and I have far more um, than I have time to be able to complete them. So the other thing is that a lot of people who have long arms will quilt for other people to help to pay for their long arms. So my guess is that in your hometown, you've got multiple people that will do it. Um, pretty much everybody is about the same price. Some people have specialties where they have a computer that does it for you, for them so that they don't have to think about it and everything comes out exact. A lot of people will do pantographs, which is where they're tracing something, a paper template on the back. And then a lot of people do free motion. I tend to just do free motion where what that means is that taking the machine, I am just moving it myself in whatever pattern I want. So um, this is a specialty in and of itself, and we have a series that we did several years ago where we did a long arm series um, with all of the different techniques that there are. We're gonna find that. Um, it probably won't be great quality, but we're gonna go ahead and load that on YouTube, so go ahead and look for that, and it is just a series of four classes. Uh, we'll probably I don't know if we'll put it all together or keep it as four separate classes, but um, but I go over all of the things in terms of different techniques and different designs and how to do straight lines, how to do filler pieces, and then some of the unique different things that you can easily do with free motion. I mentioned in the class that when you're doing your free motion movements, everything is um, five different movements. And that's the same as with your machine quilting on your domestic machine. So I think that it's important to see what it is to know how this works. Um, if you have your own, whole different class. If you want to take your quilt to quilt on somebody else's machine, you'll want to talk to them about what that's included and what they require of you and how much time you'll have the machine. If you are taking your quilt top to a long arm quilter, same thing, you'll wanna have a discussion with them. Almost every long arm quilter I know is at least six weeks out. Some of them are three to four months out because keep in mind that they might be getting 
three to four quilts a week and it takes three to four days to finish one quilt typically. So it takes a, a bit of time. So unless somebody is doing just that full time, it's difficult to stay caught up. The other thing that you'll want to know <coughs> when you take your quilt to them, <coughs> excuse me, is how they want the quilt. Typically for a long armor, they want the quilt top to be brought in, your quilt batting that you've decided to use, and your backing. And your backing, they want you to have four inches of extra all the way around. So if your quilt top is 60 by 70, they want to make sure that your batting and your backing is 68 by 78 because of the way that they load it. We need to make sure that we have all of this extra room when we're doing the quilting. So anyway, this is what a long arm machine looks like. Mine is not unlike many of the other ones. We can operate them from the front or operate them from the back. Most of them have stitch regulation, which is really what you want to make sure that your stitches stay close. Um, and again, everybody has a different specialty for the way that they do uh, what they do to finish your quilt. Since long arm quilting is really such a specialty, we're not gonna cover it so much in this particular class. We're going to encourage you to go to that other class. The last thing that I'm going to mention is that the thread that you use is a little bit different. Um, every, again, everybody has a favorite thread. Different machines like different threads. I like a 60 weight thread. I like something that is not very obvious because I want my quilt to show up, not so much my quilting. Uh, the other thing that I really like is I always keep my cotton picker with me. There's a cotton picker and then there's another one I think it's called Pam's Amazing Lint Brush or something like that. But they're very, very nice because what you'll find as you're quilting is you'll find that you have funny little threads and things in different spots. And I just like to trim threads and keep things clean while as I'm going. And I'm always finding weird little bits of thread, of course, because it's a quilt top. And then my one of my favorite long arm notions is the zircle. If you haven't seen this before, this isn't just for long arming, but this is where I keep mine. And this is a fabulous little thing. What it is, is it's a, a magnet to hold your pins, but it has some sort of a, like a dual magnet in there. So what happens is no matter how you throw your pins on, <coughs> they just Sorry. stay, that's okay. They just, um, they, the metal part goes down and the plastic part stays up so that all I have to do is reach in and grab a pin and I'm not getting poked by anything because of course you're pinning everything. So you wouldn't maybe just use this on the long arm, but this is where I use mine. And this little guy here, um, I did a little class, I just made this. Uh, it's super easy, you can kind of figure out what it is, but it just works really well um, to keep all of my stuff uh, close by while I'm long arming. So anyway, so this is quilting by long arming, the basics for what you might need to know. And again, if you have your own long arm, you're going to want to check out the other long arm class also on our YouTube channel. And we're bored. Okay. One other thing just really quick that I wanted to mention is that if you are taking your quilt top to somebody else to be machine quilted, to be long armed, the other question that they're going to ask you is thread color. Some people find that to be a difficult thing to answer. And I mentioned a minute ago that I tend to do something relatively neutral because for me, I really like to see the quilt, what I've pieced. And so for me, I don't want it to be all about the quilting. But sometimes you might want to pick something that's going to add a little bit of pizzazz. And so look at a lot of different quilts and see what you like. This is um, my Navajo Rose. And I just wanna show you, even though there's a lot going on in this quilt, this very subtle little um, variegated thread color is not too much and it makes it kind of interesting. So I have this fun little stitching that was done on this block. If you take a look at this quilt, this pattern is um, Stash Buster. And so it's a combination of seven different blocks. So it's a four patch with this little rail fence. There's some 12 inch blocks. There's um, rail fence laying down. There's a bunch of different, it's just a fun way to 
show off if there are seven different fabrics that you really like. Um, you can put together something that's kind of fun and peaceful. So this was one of the 12 inch squares and I just have a little bit of hand embroidery on there. It's very subtle. Um, and so when quilting it, I wouldn't want to necessarily quilt through that. So whether I was quilting this on my um, domestic machine, long arm hand quilting or whatever, I probably no matter what would kind of stay outside of that. So again, on my long arm, it gives me an opportunity almost like I'm doodling with a pen to do whatever I would like to do. So I'll just demonstrate a little bit. I can't really talk while we're doing it because it's quite loud and you'll see that. So you can go around it and then we can continue to fill in and go around it again. I'm actually going to lock this stitch off. And in long arming, what you have to do is you go back a little bit later and you can take these, you put them on a needle and you go through and you bury those thread ends. And that's how you get rid of that. Your other option is to knot that severely and then go ahead and clip it right at the site. So different long armors do it different ways. If you have a preference, you would want to ask them how they do it. So I always pull all of my threads up to the top so I know where my threads are that I have to deal with. I always do my stitches just to lock it. Maybe in here you would decide to do something different. Um, the most common thing is to do something called an all over. And that just means that whether it's circles, loops, or stipple, you're just doing the same pattern in the entire block. If you find that you've quilted yourself into a corner, you can sneak out by stitching in the ditch to get to where you want to be. So I like to just kind of do fun all over individual things. Some people will do an all over over the entire quilt, or again, there's pantographs. There's all sorts of designs, all sorts of things to do, but it's very relaxing because if you like to doodle, 
that's really all you're doing is you're just doodling on the quilt and you can see how easy they are to move around. This one happens to be what's considered a mid arm. So this, my particular machine is 18 inches in terms of its um, throat plate. A long arm is 28 inches and there's different sizes in between. So. So just like the other techniques with quilting your quilt, machine quilting on a domestic machine takes a little bit of practice and just a couple of notions. So when you've purchased your machine, you may or may not have ended up with a machine quilting foot. It might be called a darning foot, it might be called a hopping foot, it might be called a free motion foot, and all of them look a little bit different. Here's just a couple of them. These are all faff feet, so it might look something like that where it has, oops, a little bit of a hole in it. It might look something like that. Or this is fairly common and you might find that you have an open toe or around something a little bit different here. Because what's happening is it's hooking onto your needle bar, but it hooks on so that as your needle goes up, your foot goes up and as your needle goes down, your foot goes down. That's why it's called a hopping foot. It hops up with enough opportunity for you to kind of move the fabric underneath it and hops down and stays in the down position while your needle goes down and makes the stitch. So what happens is you are moving your fabric underneath the needle, which is remaining constant. And so you're trying to figure out what it is that you want to do. So it's fun to kind of practice a little bit and feel like you may or may not have enough um, uh, control to be able to do circles and not just do circles but come into the circle and then come back out of the circle and some of these fun stitches are because you can do your straight stitch but if you have a foot that is open enough you can go ahead and take that stitch and make it just a little bit of a zigzag stitch and see if that'll give you just a little different look which is kind of fun so you can practice and if you really like what you did on something you could just turn it into fun little placemats and it makes it kind of a fun way that you're practicing while learning how to use your domestic machine so some of the other tools that you might need for something like this again you might end up having something so that you have a little bit of a reference point so you're doing what you want to do before you go into the next one so that everything stays nice and even you might end up wanting to draw some sort of reference lines reference boxes and you would choose whichever marking utensil you like that's going to come off after you're done um, Let's see, sometimes I find that I need a pair of tweezers and that's why I keep all of those in this box because we like to bring our bobbin thread up so that we have it on the top and if you use the thread cutter option on your sewing machine, sometimes that bobbin thread is too short. So as soon as you pull it up, you have to reach in there and grab it with some tweezers and pull those out. So I just like a nice sharp pair of tweezers. Um, the other thing is this is just to remind you when you are doing free motion quilting and you're quilting through multiple layers, especially with all of that batting, what's going to happen is your machine is going to need servicing afterwards. All of that lint that's gummed up underneath there, that is not a friend to your machine. And you, if your um, thread cutter stops working or your needle threader stops working or your feed dogs are sluggish those are all really good indicators that there's something wrong with your machine so these are just some little um, machine cleaners that we have made we make these all the time and we give these out in the store but all this is is this is a coffee stir stick that we've cut in half and this is a um, pipe cleaner and so all you have to do is fold that over cut those into little bits tuck that into that corner, I mean into that end right there, and you have this really nice little swooshy um, machine cleaner just to get some of that little gunk out of there. The other thing is there's lots of different tools that are out there. This is the Westerly rulers. We really like these. 
and we do different classes where people will bring their machines and we work on these. One thing that I'll mention is that Westerly is great with YouTube. There is a YouTube video for every one of their rulers and all of the different things that you can do with them. I think that I have just about all of them. They're kind of nice little tools. The one thing you want to know though is that you do have to have a specific ruler foot that will fit your machine. They have a low shank, a high shank, and a slant shank. Um, they also have a long arm shank to be and long arm rulers to be able to use, but they're kind of fun if you want something that's extremely specific. So that's a, again a whole nother thing, but one of those other options. Other tools that you might need. Um, I kind of like to wear these gloves. These are Swan um, Swan Amity is the name of the company and these are their gloves and it's kind of nice the way that they've made them because what they've done is what's happening is when you're quilting you're holding on and I'll show you we'll go to the sewing machine and I'll show you but what you're doing is you're holding on to this fabric but you're also holding your fabric stable because you don't want to lift it up off of the table and you're moving this fabric underneath the needle so while you're doing that what these do is this gives you two fingers that are free to be able to grip whatever you're gripping, these to be able to hold on. This is so that if you have um, a, set, a, a capacitive touch machine where you're touching it, you'll be able to do that. And there's a little bit of padding here. So they come in, I think, four different sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large, I think, are the sizes. But that's what they're for, because otherwise you feel like you don't have much of a grip because you're trying to move this underneath your needle. Speaking of your needle, the other thing is that you do want to use a quilting needle. And I just want to show you my system for organizing my needles. This is actually a little tackle box. I think I paid maybe a couple dollars for this at Walmart and it fits perfectly for all of my different types of needles because you need a different needle for different jobs. So um, there's a stretch needle if you are doing minky, there's a metafill needle. If you're doing a metallic thread, you have to have a metafill needle. Um, leather for something that's a little bit heavier and you wanna make sure that it doesn't break. Sharps for something that's a little bit more invisible. I should have in here a Teflon needle. That might be what my hole is for. A Teflon needle is really good when you're doing um, a fusible web so that it doesn't stick. And then a quilting needle. Ooh, ooh. What's nice about a quilting needle is a couple things. One is it's a little bit of a sturdier needle because again, if this needle is going down as you are moving the fabric around, what will happen is if you have a really thin needle, the needle will kind of bend a little bit. And if the needle bends because you're pulling the fabric back or pulling the fabric forward a little bit sooner than before that needle hops up, you can end up either snapping the needle or you can end up pulling it away from the hook so that the hook doesn't grab the stitch and you'll have these weird little skipped stitches where you'll see that the needle has gone into the fabric but for some reason it didn't make a stitch. Or most commonly, your thread will, your thread will just break. Um, your needle will bend just a little bit, your thread breaks a little bit, um, and it's gonna be a constant problem until you put in the correct needle, which is one that's a little bit sturdier, and make sure that you do have a good thread. You really do want a 40 weight thread, something that is not going to snap or fray because it goes through the eye of the needle so rapidly and so quickly that it actually gets warm and it'll end up snapping that thread. Because again, if you've got thread breakage, it's just gonna be kind of frustrating. All right, so anyway, so that's how I store my needles so I know which ones and I always have the right needle for the job. Um, and let's see, oh, so here's our little piece. So one other thing that I'm not sure if we've talked about, so I feel like we've talked about batting a bunch. So we've got um, a polyester option, we've got a cotton option. But one other thing I want to mention is that oftentimes when you're doing a piece, especially something bigger than what we've been working on, you really do want to stabilize your piece before you quilt it. So there's a couple options. This you can't quite tell probably from the video, but this is a fusible batting. So what's really nice about this 
is that you can take this and iron it to the wrong side so it's not going to slip, it's not going to go anywhere. So that's kind of nice. This fusible, it's just there to be able to position it where it needs to go. Um, just like with fusible interfacings, it's going to wash out with within two to three washings at the most. You just iron it down so that everything stays where it's supposed to. For a piece this small, I haven't been doing any kind of stabilizing, but if I had a larger quilt, I would want to make some options or, or make some decisions about my options. So one option is to go ahead and pin it. And if you're pinning it, you end up with pins. These are kind of nice. These come in a couple different sizes. You can have a size one or a size two. And these are just these weird little curved pins. The reason that they're curved is because you're gonna go down and then it's just gonna come right back up and then it's going to lift it up off of the, oops, I really need to put my glasses on for this. It's going to lift it up off of the quilt. You don't want to quilt over the top of that. It would make, um, it would be a humongous disaster. You can also use straight pins, but straight pins are a little bit harder. You can go ahead and do that, but Again, as you're moving around and you've got your hand on top of it, you're going to end up snagging yourself and then you're gonna end up with blood everywhere. So we really don't recommend straight pins at all. Your other option is just to do a quick little basting stitch where all you're going to do is take some just obnoxious color thread that has nothing to do with your piece or the thread that you're using. So maybe some sort of a neon orange or something and just do some stitches, just do some quick running stitches so that everything is held in place. And then finally, your last option is basting spray. Oh, and let me go back. If you are going to pin baste something, make sure that you have um, the appropriate types of pins. If you have a pin that is not um, coated, then what will happen is you'll end up with funny little, if you live in a, uh, uh, a region with high humidity, you'll end up with a rusted pin and tiny little rust stains on your quilt. So um, once you've pinned it, make sure that you are working on it, you know, fairly consistently. All right, so the basted spray, there's a couple different brands. I tend to like 505, but there is a Sullivan's brand. There's um, a Sulky brand. The reason that I like the 505 is I feel like it doesn't have a great big overspray to it. Um, and it also doesn't have an odor to it, so I like that. So all you do is, let's just pretend that this is humongous. If this is a humongous quilt, we're just gonna fold the whole thing forward. So we're only dealing with half of it at a time, and I might have it on the floor in the living room. And I'm just going to spray, and then I'm going to go ahead and slide my batting back. And then it's all nice and sticky. And then I'll do the same thing on the top and slide that over and you can kind of, I can feel it, um, and then we're going to come up to where we stopped and then finally you can kind of see, let me just show you see it's all stuck on there, but it's stuck but it's repositionable if I wanted to take that off, I can pull that off. That is very sticky. So I could reposition it if I wanted to. And again, there's not much of an odor to this and I kind of prefer that. I can put that down. And then I'm ready to go. So this is the basting spray. And again, I don't tend to use anything for anything this small. I don't feel like anything's gonna slide very much. But anything, um, even a baby size quilt, I would spray baste it just to make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be. The reason for that is that if you are quilting, quilting, quilting and something, oh, this one isn't going to slide now, but things are just going to slide where they shouldn't slide and you end up with a funny little pucker. That's also why you always want to start quilting in the center. We're going to quilt in the center and work our way out so that any little puckers, any little bulges are all going to go all the way out. Otherwise, if you're quilting, even if something is basted, you could be quilting over this way 
and then you might stop and then you're going to decide to do this border and go this way and so you end up with this weird amount of fabric in the inside here and there's nowhere for that to go and so then you've got this weird pucker in there so so even when it's basted start in the center and go out and go out all right so we're gonna go over to the machine and I'm gonna show you machine quilting. So the other thing that you need um, in addition to the other tools is I feel like you need a really large work surface um, so that you're able to fully hold on to your quilt while you're moving it. So this is a so steady table. You might have something different for your machine. Um, and I just want to show you this little polishing stuff. This is like a $10 item. I have the old, um, Kind of a creamy polish but now it's a little bit more liquid it's kind of like a it's it's like a silicone is kind of what it is but it doesn't leave any kind of a residue so i just want to show you so this is just my um every day it's kind of it builds up a little bit it's not dirty in any way but it just um it has lint on it i guess it's not really again it's not dirty that's not what's happening with it but this stuff what it does is I'm just gonna put it on part of it because I want you to see what happens. And it's just a polish. And so you get this little piece of terry cloth in your bag, and then you also get this little chamois. I'm even gonna skip the chamois for you just to show you that when you polish it, all you're doing is you're just making it slickery. So look at the difference. The difference is like this. See how smooth this is? Look over here where I didn't do it. It, it slides off on its own. And over here, not at all. Oh, <laughs> okay, it slid off a little bit when it was a little top heavy. But what it does, what that little polish does, is it just makes it nice and smooth because when we're ready to quilt, what we're gonna do is we just want to fully be able to move things around. So we've already talked about the different feet and all of those different things. Um, I have my specific foot on here that I'm going to use and um, okay. And so again, to start, what you're going to do is I'm going to bring the, oh, I shouldn't start right in the center there. Well, find a little inconspicuous place here and bring up that bobbin thread. And the main reason that you're bringing up the bobbin thread is because then if you don't and you just sort of leave your bobbin thread down there to kind of do whatever it does, it's gonna be this big old nasty thread nest on the back. So pull it up so you know where it's at, so you can control it. And then we're gonna come over to right where we pulled that bobbin thread up and that's where we're gonna start. So I'm going to go ahead and just bring my needle right down in that same place. And I'm just gonna hold on to that for a second. Oh, gloves. And again, these are the ones that I like. And for something so small as this, we probably don't really need to wear these, but when you're dealing with something that's a whole lot bigger, this is what makes it really nice. All right, so I'm gonna hold on to that little thread that I have there until I get that out of the way. And then all you're going to do is, as you're holding on to this, I'm just going to move it while I'm quilting. So it's, again, similar to moving the paper underneath the pen.
Okay, so I've changed the view for you here so you can see this just a little bit easier. So I went ahead and quilted in here. I did do just a fun little line and now I'm just doing a little stipple on the outside edge. So again, just so you can kind of watch how this works. I'm gonna try to talk over the sound of the machine. And so what's happening is the machine is hopping up and down and stitching and all I'm doing whoops, is moving it underneath. And you can, if you stop, stop with your needle in the down position. And what will happen, let me just show you, is if I move a little too slow, but my needle is going up and down, I'm gonna have a lot of really close stitches. And by the same token, if I move too fast, let me just show you. Oh, I didn't really. Um, then I'll have big stitches. So because you, your feed dogs have dropped while you're stitching. And so there's nothing that's guiding your fabric through while you're stitching. You're the one who's moving it. So that's why you want to make sure that you're fairly even. So what I tell people is move your needle fast and your hands slow. Oops. And I have to admit, I am not very good at domestic machine quilting because I don't do this very often. I own a long arm. And so I tend to put things on my long arm, even little things. In fact, what I'll do is if I have a bunch of pieces like this, I will just load a back and then I'll spray some 505 and I'll put them down and I'll just quilt them all, cut them all apart and I'm done. So I can make a ton of mug rugs on my long arm. So I'm a cheater and it's good for me every once in a while just to do this, just to remember woo, how to do it. But I'm not great at it. Anyway, I'm gonna finish this up and I'll show you when I'm done. Stitching in the ditch is a really nice option for machine quilting on your sewing machine, on your domestic machine. If you want to do machine quilting, but you're finding some difficulty with the free motion aspect of it, another option is that stitching in the ditch. So let's look at this a little bit closer up. If you look right here, what you can see is that the stitching is essentially in the ditch, that ditch that's created from sewing these seams together. So it becomes basically invisible. So this is just a quick little four patch. The name of this fabric is Llama Llama. So it's just squares and four patches, squares and four patches. It can be made pretty much in any size, pretty quickly, tiny little border that's also stitched in the ditch, and then a big border that's left okay. So if you look on the back, you can see that same pattern that's created from those nice straight lines because you followed that. So it's just a really fun, easy, simple option with quick results. There's another option in this little pillow form, the same idea, so you can really see that if you're making a pillow form or a uh, pillow sham, we have a separate class for that that we'll show you. What's happened is all we've had to do is take our panel, and I realize this panel may not be everybody's taste, but for this panel, all we did is we took this, and this isn't pieced, of course, this is just a printed panel, but in stitching in the ditch on that polyester batting, it creates this nice little quilted texture for this block. And then we put the border on it, quilted the border, and then we did this cool little pillow. So. This is, this is a separate class for um, decorator pillows and pillow shams, but you can see that same stitching in the ditch technique. So I'm gonna show you how to do it. So here is our little block with our little border on it. So again, what I've chosen is I've chosen just a thin little polyester batting. I have my backing, I have everything all layered together. You might want to either baste it or spray baste it or pin it, but 
for my project, I'm not going to do that because I know that it's not slipping or sliding at all because this is just a 10 inch block. So the only thing that I need is I do like a different foot. So I sew on a faff and so I'm gonna take this foot off and show you, oops, found it. Okay, so this is it. So it has this funny little, so here's my foot and it has this funny little blade right in the center of it. So this is a faff foot. I know that Viking and Husqvarna also make one that look really similar and I'm not sure about other brands, but I would assume a stitching in the ditch or they call it an SID foot, is probably fairly common. So I know for FAF, I think it's like about a $24 foot. Well worth it, because then we're just gonna snap it on. And then what happens, it's like magical, because then all you have to do is this little blade is going to just ride right along there. So I always do it the same way. I bring up the bobbin thread up to the top and you can see then that that's where I'm at is right in that very very corner there right where we're stitching so that I'm going to be stitching right in the ditch now if you don't have this specialty foot it's fairly easy to watch your needle stay right there in that ditch and not have any trouble and not get off of it and as long as you're the same color as this background, you wouldn't be able to see it too much. And you're probably okay. Um, but I just like to show this stitch in the ditch foot, which I think is just super amazing. Okay, so see how it's just riding right there? And as you're sewing, you almost can't get off because it's just riding right on that edge right there. And I'll take this foot off for the other half of it just to show you the distance or the difference. And so see, it just rides right along there, right in the ditch. And I'm just gonna go ahead and back stitch for a second because, I'm gonna take this foot off, because if you take a look at this stitching, it is absolutely invisible. You cannot see any stitches at all, which is kind of cool. So you have that texture, that quilty texture there a little bit, but you don't see the stitches at all. Now, unfortunately, if you don't have that stitch in the ditch foot, let's just put on um, an open toed foot, something so that you're really clearly able to see what's going on. So I'm just gonna choose this one. And so then I just have to really watch what I'm doing and make sure that I'm right in between that line and the needle is coming down. So I can't go quite as fast without that stitch in the ditch foot, which is just sort of a, I mean, you can't mess up with that, but it's not to say that stitching in the ditch is super difficult. So you're basically just sewing in a straight line. And then for me personally, when I get to the end, I'm either going to backstitch or in this case, a little knot, cut that off, and there it is. So again, even without the specialty foot, it's a pretty invisible quilting stitch. Pretty easy to see pretty easy to see the texture, not so easy to see the stitch. So kind of a fun, so that is known as stitching in the ditch. Now what we're gonna do is I'm just going to show you one other option with this and that is the idea. 
So this is what Faf calls their wing foot. It has these little wings, I guess, these little flaps that come off to the side, and then you have this equal measurement grid. And so if you want to do some fun little stitching, you can just line this up on whichever one you choose. And go ahead and go around. And this is the fourth time around, so you can see that all of those lines just kind of line up. It's kind of easy. Okay, so we're going to talk about tied quilts, finally. So I just have to give full disclosure and say that I tend not to tie quilts. I used to years and years ago, but I probably haven't done it in 30 years. Uh, not that there's anything wrong. I think it's a great option. It's just that I like to machine quilt. I've owned a long arm since 1999. And even prior to that, I was taking my quilts to be quilted or hand quilting them. So. If you decide to uh, um, tie your quilt, you do want to choose your tying material carefully um, and keep in mind that your quilt, if you have good quality fabric, your quilt is going to last for quite a while um, and you want to make sure that your tie will also. So if you've chosen an inexpensive yarn, keep in mind that that's going to fray, it's going to you know, maybe get a little crinkly if it's in the dryer a lot, so you might have a lot, of, a lot of other options. I've also seen some really pretty ways where people have tied them like almost like upside down so that there's just a funny little, funny little dash on the front of the quilt and there's this, all of these ties on the back. So there's kind of some fun, unique options. Um, when I did tie, I always used embroidery floss. Oops. Oh, this is bad. Um, this is <laughs> this is why we tend to use um, only 18 inches of thread is because it will knot itself Whew. but when you tie you end up having it a little bit longer so what we do is pull it through here so you do have to use a hoop when you're tying. You have to use something that's going to stabilize everything because you're moving relatively fast through the squares and so you just want to make sure that everything is stabilized while you're doing that. So um, people that have these large quilting frames, that's what they'll use for that. I don't have a large quilting frame. I just have this as my large hoop. So um, we're just going to do a few squares here and I'm gonna show you. Um, I do use a straight needle. A lot of people that are doing the tying, they will use a curved needle because they feel like they can go through a little bit quicker, but it's up to you. I like a straight needle. And then again, um, my just my pearl cotton in whatever color you'd like. A thing I'll just mention is that since you're using a hand needle, anything that you might need in terms of a needle threader or a thimble, it's always kind of nice to have those on hand. All right, so all I'm gonna do, it's very, very simple, almost one of those sinfully simple ones. All right, let me put my glasses on. So we're gonna decide just to do them in the center of these four squares. And so all I'm gonna do, and you can see that this is why people will use the curved one, because you can come in and come right back out fairly closely. So I'm just gonna take a stitch and then all I'm going to do is pull this, leave enough on there, and then I'm going to come to the next one, and I'm just kind of eyeballing where my center is, and I have to put my hand under there. There's another one. up to my next one okay. 
and I probably really would turn around and go the other way, but because of where the camera is, I'm gonna cross over, which is totally not gonna matter. And then again, do I feel like I'm in the center? Yeah. Another little stitch. What's nice about tying is you don't have to start or end. You don't have to start with a knot. So you're just threading, and that's why you can have kind of a little bit longer one. I would just keep going and keep going and keep going, but just for our purposes, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. So I'm gonna cut that. And then all I'm gonna do is go right in the middle, cut, right in the middle, cut. Did I cut it? Did it make it? Right in the middle, cut. And tie a knot. Now a quilter's knot is three. Oh, did I do three? Three. <laughs> and so you're going to tie one. Oops. Two has to be three. Three. Go on to the next one. And again, the whole purpose of tying a quilt is the same as all of the other steps. You have to tie it in order to hold your front, your batting, and your backing all together to make sure that nothing is slipping and that you don't have your batting wadding up in the corner of your quilt. So it's up to you to decide how close your ties should go. I used to say that in terms of hand quilting, machine quilting, or even tying, that you don't wanna go more than five inches apart. Um, a lot of it depends on the batting that you're using, but I just always used my hand as a nice reference to say that nothing should be more, th more than a hand's width apart. This is a little bit large, but I happen to know that the batting in this one is more of a sheet, and so it really wasn't gonna go anywhere anyway. Same thing, one, two, three, and then I would do the same thing with the last one. And then you decide how long or how short you want to cut them. So people have all different ways of measuring, you know, how, how long they want it to be. So um, what my grandmother used to do is she just marked her finger you know, or she knew that she was going from here to her first knuckle, and that was where she cut it. So she's going from here, she's holding on to that, and she'd go to her first knuckle and cut it. So, or if you wanted something shorter, again, just mark a little mark on your finger. So you're gonna come here and cut it. There you go. So, and then we would have done the same one there. So that's how I would tie. Again, you just want to make your decisions based on the color of your tie, the quality of your tie product to make sure that your tie will last as long as your quilt top. All right, and that's tying. All right, so the last one I'm gonna show is the chunky stitch, and or it's also known as the big stitch, and it's just kind of a fun one. So I'm going to show you on the edge of this border, but I just wanna show you this one quilt. So it's just an easy thing to do. Again, um, I think I showed you this in the beginning, but it's just a great big visible stitch. It's meant to be seen. It's kind of like hand quilting, but you're using a bold thread in a large stitch so it sort of takes over what you're doing. I do suggest that you use a hoop when you do it, whatever hoop you'd like, and I do like DMC. So I'm gonna show you up close how to do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the big stitch on my little hand quilting sample here, just because I really like this border, and I think with all of these little stripes, it'll be easy to go ahead and do a big stitch. So. It really is just using embroidery floss, whichever DMC or Valdani, whatever floss you like to use, it doesn't make any difference. I do like a cotton floss, just because then you don't have to worry about it. And you get to choose your color. I'm not sure which is the right color, and it doesn't really matter. There's no such thing as right color. There's just the matter of what you choose. And so you just wanna lay it out. Uh, the idea is that it's a little bit imperfect, it's a large, and it's something that you kind of want to see. That being said, I don't know if it was the right decision or not, but I chose the ivory. I think the ivory is a little bit weird because the background is white, but eh, I just wanted to see what it was gonna look like. So basically what you're doing, a big stitch is if 
embroidery and hand quilting had a baby, they would have a big stitch. So that's all you're doing. This is just an embroidery needle, embroidery floss. I've knotted it. If you want to do this on something different or outside of a block, whatever you want to do, just go ahead and either have some sort of a reference line that you're using or draw a line. For me, again, since this border has a line, that's what I'm going to follow. So all I'm doing, and I had mentioned using a hoop, but I just thought this would be easier for you to see. You're just going to do basically that hand quilting stitch only bigger. So it doesn't really matter as long as it's fairly even and I can tell I do not have my thimble on but that's okay. Same idea, you're just going to go ahead and you can see the difference when you're using a bigger needle and more stitches. It's a little bit harder to pull through. And I had mentioned that one thimble that had that little pole factor to it. This might be the right thing. So see, there's your big stitch. I'm just going to keep going. And I might put a few less stitches on there. Oh, that's a little easier. And just like in hand quilting, you want to pull your thread in the direction that you want your stitch to lay. And you just keep going. And you can add as many rows and as many stitches as you'd like. 